Welcome to Rising Ideas Pod. I am Jay Bal Nadwat, Vice President of the Observer Research Foundation, and I have with me in conversation Mr. Ivan Korkok, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Slovak Republic. Welcome to Rising Ideas Pod, sir. Thank you very much, and many thanks for having me. So Slovakia and India celebrate 30 years of excellent diplomatic relations. Uh, Slovakia's position aligns much with the Indian position at various multilateral fora. Uh, however, our relationship in terms of trade, etc., have been in some very traditional areas, and they've not really expanded. What are the new areas in which uh, India and Slovakia can collaborate to the benefit of each other and to the greater common good of all? First, I want to underscore what you have said, namely India is a very close uh, nation, partner in international relations from our own Slovak perspective. You know, we are a small Central European country and our focus is mainly on, on our area, on our neighborhood, but we are living in, in, in a global globalized world and therefore we are reaching out beyond this area of our main focus in Central Europe and of course India is a, is a very welcome partner. Number two, as you have said, there is tradition it's 30 years of our relationship, but of course it reaches out back to the pre-Slovakia time between former Czechoslovakia. And there were traditional areas of cooperation. I will elaborate on them. But first, even during my term, we have um, really intensified the political dialogue. That's very important. Uh, today or tomorrow, my successor is going to meet for the third time with uh, Mr. Minister Jakanshar within 10 months. He visited Slovakia. I was here, I'm here now, Foreign Minister of Slovakia is here. So I'm saying this because there is a good foundation for this partnership. And there are traditional areas, for example, defense. Today we are opening uh, Indian-Slovak Defense Cooperation Forum because this is a traditional area of cooperation. But two, Minister of Foreign Affairs is signing today a protocol on cultural exchange. So there are other areas where basically we want to bring our people more together to get uh, get to know each other uh, even better. And then in Slovakia, we are automotive superpower and there is a whole cluster of uh, industries which, which was de developed around automotive with IT sector, electronics. So simply said, we wanna explore the areas of economic cooperation with more added value. And I think India is a superpower when it comes to digital economy digital skills and, and the digital technology, I think we can together achieve more. I would wrap it up by saying that uh, this year will be a record year when it comes to uh, trade turnout between Slovakia and India. It, we hope it will closely, it, it will reach uh, 1 billion US dollars per, per year. We are a small economy. So I think there is a very good perspective, but there is political interest and political will on our side to cooperate more closely. So India and Slovakia have uh, collaborated and cooperated very closely on various multinational fora. Right. But as things have, uh, things show us as the way the conflict in Eurasia and uh, conflicts around the world show us uh, the inability of global institutions to respond to situations uh, like COVID and uh, they point to a certain inefficacy in them. How do you think uh, multilateralism uh, could could respond and be relevant uh, in in the current situation the, there is no other alternative to multilateralism the, the tragedies that that we are observing around the world they just demonstrate what it means what one of the distinguished speakers have said yesterday at the opening namely multilateralism is fatally wounded and is laying on the ground multilateralism as such is suffering a, suffering a major major blow from international community. So we are lacking multilateralism. We have to reestablish that based on trust and uh, cooperation because otherwise we will be seeing and we will be witnessing uh, the conflicts as such as those uh, as we see in, in Slovakia in our direct neighborhood. You've mentioned inefficacy of international institutions. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is the proper word, inefficacy. But, but my point is that institutions as such, they cannot be effective unless those who are part of these institutions, it's us, it's the states, it's the sovereign states which, uh, which represent the, the membership of those institutions, 
respect and observe the basic uh, principles uh, of international relations, uh, international law, uh, the prohibition of use and threat of force. So those kind of things are the precondition uh, for the institutions to work and operate. You cannot artificially establish efficacy of something which when, when the members of those institutions are acting in an opposite way. And uh, I, I think we, it's a case study uh, uh, when it comes to the failure of multilateralism, breach of international law, humanitarian law, use of force and so on. So when it comes to the war against Ukraine, it must be, it must be a turning point. Uh, and I understand you in India, in Indo-Pacific regions, when you believe that we are too Eurocentric at this moment when we are suffering from, from this war, I agree entirely with you that in, in the past we've not been paying um, enough attention to other conflicts. But this is a turning point really in terms of the need to reflect on once again the very basic principles such as multilateralism and, and international law in order to prevent uh, people uh, from, from further suffering as, as we are seeing that just a few hundred kilometers away from, uh, from, from Slovakia. So this is, this is horrible, this is a failure. Uh, there is a clear responsibility on the Russian side because this is unprovoked uh, aggression. But we need to uh, sit at the table and together and collectively resurrect, if you want, our commitment to multilateralism. Because unilaterally, uh, and, and when insisting on in individual interests, uh, which are then pursued by force, that, uh, that's going to bring us uh, to, to further suffering. You have so rightly said about the conflict in, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, uh, the, in, in Eurasia being a turning point for Europe. So has the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, led to the rise of European solidarity? Do you see resurgence of uh, pan-European nationalism uh, and we hear about European states coming together in a way like never before? That's an interesting question. Uh, I, I would respond it with absolutely yes when it comes to solidarity, because, you know, in Slovakia, we are a neighboring country. Imagine within the first days of conflict, one million refugees have crossed the border. We are 5 million, 5.5 5 million, 5 .5 million uh, uh, citizens country. And one million entered uh, the border from east of Ukraine to Slovakia over, over two weeks or within two weeks. Imagine one-fifth of our population. Uh, many of them continued then and uh, traveled to their relatives uh, across uh, Europe, but uh, dozens, thousands of them have stayed uh, in Slovakia. What else, if not solidarity, uh, was challenged? And therefore, we've been uh, helping each other, assisting. It's, uh, I mean, among European countries, but at the same time, it is a solidarity of our citizens, you know, who who have shared part of their well-being, if you want, with those uh, in need. So definitely yes to solid solidarity. Pan-European nationalism, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I have not even realized that it could be this kind of, or, or this dimension, or this angle from which you can look at this. Uh, I would clearly say no. The opposite is, uh, is, the, is, is reality. Namely, we see what consequence nationalism, uh, which Russian Federation basically was imposing on, on Ukraine can cause. There are people are being died, are, are being killed, people are dying in, in Ukraine just for the mere fact that they Ukrainians. They were in a, so to say, the, the narrative which preceded the war, uh, which we've been hearing from, uh, from Russian Federation, was built around the uh, underlying idea that there is no such nation like Ukraine. So, yes, solidarity, but definitely not pan-European pan -European nationalism, but rather pan-European solidarity, pan-European determination to oppose this uh, gross breach of uh, international law, because this is a threat to the entire European security architecture. So, is, is uh, Central and Eastern Europe becoming the new arbiter for a new European identity. Is the gravity of European politics shifting to, the, shifting to Central and Eastern Europe? 
I mean, of course, this um, this this war in in our neighborhood, this war in the very heart of of Europe, is a in a way game changer. It is in a way uh, because countries in the in the western part of Europe they just see what is going on in 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 the in the eastern flank, uh, if you want. And you are right. Um, when you maybe not, gravity is moving that much, but definitely it is the point from which these countries have made clear to Europe, but I think globally as well, what is at stake? So, because we are directly affected, we are neighboring country, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Romania, uh, Hungary, uh, those countries and the Baltic countries, we are direct neighbors to, to this uh, horrible development. And the world is therefore focused on us. They are attentively listening to us, how we are basically struggling with that, uh, how we are trying to mobilize the support, both humanitarian and military support. Because it, it is not an exaggeration when I say that there, there is a real, real threat uh, if Ukraine loses then Slovakia will have a new neighbor. And we don't want to be a direct neighbor to the Russian Federation because this was a full-scale uh, military invasion with the view to taking over, basically, the uh, Ukrainian uh, and the democratically elected uh, government uh, in Kiev. So we, it's a, it's a, the, the whole order is at stake. And indeed, you are absolutely right. The, the European countries, but also globally, they are listening to those who are most affected and who are confronted with that, with that in our direct neighborhood. So the EU has come with uh, a renewed focus on the Indo-Pacific in April of 2021, the new Indo-Pacific uh, document and cooperation. Uh, Central and East Europe particularly is, uh, uh, and the V4 are very, uh, are, are seemingly recalibrating their engagements in the Indo-Pacific. And we see new engagements with Taiwan. Uh, we see new engagements with other states. Uh, where is this rethink coming from? I mean, and 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 what is the new thinking in the capitals yeah. of uh, Central Europe? You you are right because you know when I when I look back at the last fifteen to twenty years, our main focus was to be integrated in, in, into the Western uh, institutions. We were busy with that. I was leading negotiations of my country uh, to, to NATO. So as the chief negotiator on our accession uh, to NATO. Later on, we've joined European Union. But as time is elapsing and, and passing by, we of course are looking uh, around more, more intensively and definitely in the Pacific region. When you look at your economic strength, and you look at the um, economic potential, when you look at the security and defense dimension, when you look at the, at the, at the shift in, in geopolitical uh, circumstances, it is this region. And therefore, when I was foreign minister, definitely I was the one who said that it's not only about classical diplomacy, but it's about us who are obliged to knock on the doors and open uh, uh, and open those, those doors for, uh, especially for economic cooperation, because at the end of the day, it's about jobs. And if we can cooperate more closely, we take into account the Indo-Pacific region represents three out of four uh, biggest economies in the world outside of European Union. When Indo-Pacific uh, region contributes with two thirds to global growth, uh, when you look at the areas like digital uh, economy, and others, it, we, shim, we, sim, we simply have no other choice but to explore opportunities for, uh, for closer cooperation. And similarly, you have, you have mentioned Taiwan, for example. We, have, we respect one China policy, uh, of course. Um, on the other hand, uh, having good relationship uh, with, uh, with China, uh, we, of course, in Slovakia, uh, Taiwanese investment is four times bigger than the Chinese in, uh, investment. So therefore, this is, uh, there are interests, and we want to we wanna use that, the, those opportunities and tap that potential uh, for, for prosperity, for, for our own citizens. It's the same what my dear colleague Jack Anshar is engaged in when he is coming to Central Europe, when we are meeting in different formats with India, 
bilaterally in Slovakia, but also in the formats you have mentioned, for example, the, the Visegrad 4. India is it's big, it's big, you know, population-wise, territory-wise, and therefore I understand you, you are trying to identify uh, partners, but, but possibly uh, who are a bit more commensurate with, <laughs> with, your, with your size. And, and therefore, for example, Visegrad 4, Visegrad 4 is a very, uh, very well-proven platform for that. Well, with that, we end our conversation. So thank you very much, Mr. Prokop, for your very, very insightful views. And thank you for joining us again at uh, Rizina Ideas Pod. Thank you very much. And I cannot uh, end but thanking and congratulating organizing of the, of, on this excellent, outstanding uh, forum and very good platform for exchange of views. Thank you for your very, very kind words. Thank you so much. Thank you.